Welcome back, California geographers. It's your favorite backyard geographer and professor, Jeremy Patridge, giving a quick presentation on California's historic and present biogeography. So the purpose of this presentation is to really talk about biogeography, what it is, uh, and really to show how multifaceted, and essentially this could be an entire like 16-week course. So I have to really cut out a lot of the, of the content just to try to make this into a shorter video, but know that other videos throughout the rest of this uh, collection will also encompass much of the biogeography found in California, such as, as an example, agriculture and water wars. So let's begin. So I picked this incredible photo of the Page Museum, now known as the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, perhaps you've been in Los Angeles. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't, you've got to check it out. I'll certainly talk about more about as to why a little bit later. So what is biogeography? Well, it's really the study of the geographical distribution of organisms, their habitats, historical biological factors, which perhaps produce them, and just really geologic time in relation to life. So it's a multiple disciplinary topic. So what I've done here is I've created this little bubble. So biogeography is in the middle, but when we say that I'm a biogeographer, I'm interested in studying climate. I'm interested in studying the ecology the geology, paleontology, pedology, that's probably the one you don't know, soils, and then anthropology and even archaeology, is that we look at a little bit of everything because we want to understand the past, the present, and then by understanding those two realms, we're able to use that as prediction and understanding for the future, especially when it deals with any of these things. As we know, climate is changing. We understand that biogeography within the ecology is changing. And when looking at perhaps tree lines and seeing how new vegetation and things are moving, uh, perhaps even looking at just um, uh, looking at coral reefs, looking at the geology and plate tectonics, volcanism, stuff like that. Uh, so just kind of working through this whole circle uh, really empowers you to know that, wow, biogeography is just, it's not just a simple thing. That's why there's actually degrees in biogeography. So the purpose of this, again, is to kind of talk about the importance of California and just learning that California is incredibly diverse and that we have, we can study all of this and so much more in such a small space compared to looking at other regions around the world. So who says so? Well, Alfred Wallace was a naturalist, an explorer, a geographer, an anthropologist, a biologer, a biologer, biologist, and even a geologist. And he was considered the father of biogeography. What's interesting about him is that he published a lot of work looking at biogeography around the world. In fact, many of his, his works went with Charles Darwin, uh, which they only met once in person, but that being said, uh, the fact that he was able to do all of this research and publish so much really kind of pushed Charles Darwin to publish his book on the origin of species. And as you know, with Charles Darwin, um, that really kind of set, that, that was a, a mo moment in time when science changed. Because obviously there were a lot of people that did not believe in the theory of evolution. Uh, and there were a lot of people that were saying, well, it can only make sense. I mean, things change. We see that. We see that through generations of just people. Like, as an example, since we're talking about people, um, I'm very fortunate that I have some of the uh, heritage and some of the items that date back to my great, great, great grandparents. Uh, and looking at just their jewelry and looking at things like that, how little the jewelry was and how you know, frail, you know, the women's hands would have been in the sense of how small compared to how robust the, the you know, the, the male figure hands were. Um, you know, not trying not try to play some role one way or another, but just seeing how different uh, that is today, you know, and seeing that size and shape and how, um, you know, even just looking at away from just the human aspect, thinking about clothing, it's like, how does that, you know, how has that evolution been seen? You know, is the changing of clothing of evolution based on comfort? Is it based on climate? Is it based on weather? I mean, there's lots of different things that we can look at, which is pretty cool. But going back into the geology, I love saying this word, Gondwana land. So Gondwana land was the lower part of Pangea. Uh, you had uh, Laurasia above it. But nonetheless, I want to talk about Gondwana land because this is a great example for us to see the geologic record across all the, the world, really. So what we were able to do is we found these interesting outcrops of fossils. And then we found these inter interesting outcrops matched up with different places, which kind of helped 
you know, well, solve a lot of answers, right? We wanted to know, well, if these land-dwelling animals were somehow connected, how could they have swum across the ocean? Or seeing that, uh, you know, they only would have survived in certain types of climate. Maybe it's a type of vegetation or a fern. And so to see that there are these correlations, obviously not all of these exist at the same time, but during this time of Gondwana land, allows us to understand the uh, theory of plate tectonics, to understand also looking at um, geologic time and also looking at the fossil record and seeing that it is a global piece that we're able to find as an example we can find this is a trilobite uh, trilobite paradoxides which is essentially a freshwater sea animal kind of like cockroach type thing one of the first multi-celled organisms and we find them around the world but there's different variations in species but we find so when you find different variations in species then we know that they're very unique so if I find one exactly like this in Europe then that starts to you know I begin to ask questions well why why would it be there why would we find this in uh, say the you know, Brazil area but also in Africa or we would have found it in other areas that found in Europe and looking at different types of, of, of when continents had then converged and moved together and then moved apart we start to see these patterns to put it together Kind of a fun fact, you know, right in this little space right here, I mean, obviously for this diagram uh, that the United States Geological Survey uses, it's very basic. Uh, these continents would have looked a little bit differently, but there was actually a landmass right in here, and it was, it turns out to be, it was a part of a U.S. state. Any guess as to what U.S. state would have been part of Gondwana land? I didn't know what you said, but... It was Florida. Florida was part of Gondwana land, which is pretty cool. So let's look at more biology. So we have lots of different biomes. California is a living laboratory divided up into landforms and regions. We have a little bit of everything. Um, the biomes found in California are incredibly diverse. And if you think of just what's, this is like a traditional biome diagram showing all the different, you know, tropical, temperate, uh, subarctic, and then arctic. It's broken up based on uh, dryness, so this is very dry to moist, and then temperature, and looking at cold to hot. So looking at all these options, which ones do you think belong in California? And I gave you the answers down here, but we see that we have the grasslands, chaparral, deserts, and we also do have some temperate forests. We'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. But we do have a lot of diversity, which is really cool in California. I mean, again, we talked about in previous presentations that California is obviously very long, as you can see behind me. So we're able to see that there's a lot of different diversity just based on latitude alone. That's why we can say, oh, you know, up in the uh, northern part of California, it could be, well, it's almost rainforest. It's right on the, on the borderline of how many inches they get per year. But, you know, pre you know great precipitation versus places down here. Uh, where, especially more inland, more towards the Death Valley, Badwater Basin, one of the hottest places on Earth, and receiving less than two inches of rain per year, if that, versus several, you know, 20 to 30 inches of rain up in here. So it's very interesting to see that just, you know, we have, there, you know, a day that you can drive from San Diego to Sacramento in a day. It's not a big deal. It's a long day, but you could do it. But to think of all the difference that you will traverse within that time is really impressive. And then just think of just vegetation alone within the biomes is very unique because you know we've got the desert and the grassland. Most of where we live is in the chaparral, so it's not quite dry and all hot. We do get some moisture like Los Angeles gets between like 12 and 13 inches of rain per year, which puts us more in a chaparral type region. Uh, but we do have areas that are somewhat arguably grassland as well, which is pretty cool. So I found this, these two diagrams, and I kind of like had to alter them a little bit to make them to be about the same size. And I thought this was interesting. So we're looking at vegetation on the right. So we can see, oop, how do we get rid of that? There we go. Uh, grasslands, desert, conifer, chaparral, oaks, uh, agriculture lands, wetlands, junipers, others, and then urban landscapes. Then on the other side, I have a map showing just precipitation values, which is interesting because it probably at first you thought that this was more terrain. Maybe it's a relief of California showing elevation, but it's not. It's actually showing precipitation. Um, it says here annual average precipitation. Uh, this is data collected between 1900 and 1960. So we can see that there are areas that are very dry down here, and we can find that those are usually areas that, are, that correspond within your desert. We can see that 
uh, part of uh, the you know, Napa Valley, stuff like that. We're looking at more of your chaparral. We see that it gets a little bit more rain. You're looking at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 inches of rain per year. Looking at places up in Northern California, you can see that they get up into the 30s and 40s, depending on the year. Uh, you know, it's just very interesting. You know, also we have this line right here. You can see my uh, arrow. The Sierra Nevada that runs right here. Sierra Nevada again that runs through here. So does that play? Do we find that topography plays a role on precipitation? Does it play a role on the type of vegetation that's able to thrive? And the answer is yes. Um, but because of how unique our climate is, and you know, it allows us to have a very diverse type of environment when it comes to vegetation, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I guess that this was an interesting way. You can certainly relay this back to other presentations that I've had when looking at how we you know, devise and divide up the state of California into different regions. And we can see that precipitation and vegetation can certainly play a role on those regions themselves. So moving in here, we have an incredible tree record. So here are three really important trees. I know there's four on this map, but I love this image. Uh, trees, great trees of the world. We have some incredible trees. We have first, uh, it's Methuselah, which is up in here. It's found in the White Mountains. It's, it's the White Mountains, so you have the Sierra Nevada uh, to the west, and then you have the you know eastern Sierra, then to the east of it is White Mountains, which is next to the Inyos. Um, Methuselah is the oldest tree that we know of. It's over 4,700 years old. It's way older than the pyramids in Egypt, which is really weird to think. How do we know that? Well, a long time ago, there was another tree. It actually, I think it dated 4,900 years old, but they didn't know how to date it without cutting it down. So they cut down the tree to count the tree rings. Now we don't need to do that. We're able to do tree rings, which is essentially called dendrochronology, where we drill a hole, very small hole through the center of the tree all the way across, pull that out. It really doesn't do any damage to the tree because it just fills back in. But then we're able to see all the distinct layers and count how old the tree is. Uh, we don't need to, but in olden days, we would literally go, wow, that looks like it's a really old tree. Let's cut it down. But you know, once you cut it down, the tree's dead. So we don't do that anymore. But uh, Methuselah is uh, 4,700 years old in the bristlecone pine forest. If you've been on a field trip of mine, we've certainly been up there as well. We also have the General Sherman, which is the largest, tall, the world's largest tree. Uh, it's 52,000 cubic feet. So it's a massive, massive tree, very different uh, than these very small, gnarled, twisted trees of the bristle cones. And then we have the Hyperion, which is the tallest tree, at over 380 feet in the air, straight up, which is really impressive. So as you can see, this is throughout the state of California, northern, central, and then eastern Sierra, three different regions of our state, three very different types of trees, three very different types of records. But, you know, as this tree has lived 4,700 years, we are finding that the bristle cones are starting to die very slowly, but they are because of climate change, because they require a very specific type of climate, very specific amount of ice or precipitation, also needs a very specific type of radiation that comes from the soils. And we just find that the tree line, or the line in which these trees thrive, is starting to increase in a sense, which means it gives them less area to grow. And, you know, a tree mm, about this big, say, is about 50 years old, um, which is really impressive to think that, that, you know, you could plant a bristle cone, and by the time you leave this earth, you it probably still couldn't decorate it for a holiday tree. It'll still be too small. But things are changing, obviously, and these plants are not able to adapt. So other things that we can look at is agriculture, again, without stealing the thunder of another presentation because there's a lot to say, it's still important to talk about the biogeography of agriculture as it was, as it is, and as it will be. California produces almost everything. We have an area that we can grow just about everything across the state. And we don't just provide to the state of California, we ship it not across just the U.S., but around the world. So as an example, most of the nuts that are, that are farmed and processed in California, such as almonds, we send those to other countries because we can actually buy theirs at a less cost and ours is more of a premium, higher quality nut. Uh, fun fact, uh, California, we had 10 years of very severe drought in which we did lose a lot of our almond farms. But what's interesting is if you've been to Disneyland and you've bought one of my favorite candies, which is um, it's the it's like the sugar with the almonds, and they dip it in the chocolate almond on the outside. It's a um, it's a toffee, 
uh, English toffee in a sense, but they only use California almonds, and they always have been. So uh, when the almonds were unavailable, they quit making that candy there. It was a very, very, oh, uh oh, I have an United States, sorry. Um, that being said, just look at these certain areas. I mean, obviously, you think San Bernardino, we talked about going back to this map for a moment. Desert, great. But we come here and it grows number 19. Milk, eggs, nursery, plants, beef, cattle, grapes, avocados, grapefruit, bell peppers, dates. So it's like, wait a minute, even in the most arid and dry areas of our state, we're still producing something. And the answer is yes. Also, down in this area here, like Imperial Valley, I know it says here wood. Uh, ornamental and, and bedding plants, but um, also in that case, we do rice, which requires a lot of water. So an area that does not have water uh, certainly has a lot of vegetation that we grow there that needs it. So think of where you live. So I'm right here on the cusp of Ventura in Los Angeles County. So we're known for our strawberries, nursery plants, ornamental trees and shrubs, uh, bedding, plants, avocados, lemons, and vegetables. That's what grows best in this area. Farther north, up by Bakersfield, obviously we have more milk, cotton, almonds, oranges. So think of places that you've been, that you travel to, and see what's there. I mean, also just thinking about Area 17, you can see cattle's very prominent there, uh, all through the this region here. And if you've ever driven up towards, uh, you know, beyond Bakersfield, heading maybe towards Northern California, when it complains of the smell of the fertilizer, and it's because this is where a lot of your milk sheds come from. Except for we have some in Altadena, Pasadena area and stuff like that. But I guess thought this was something interesting. So look at some of the areas without, throughout the state. These are all uh, outlined by the counties, but you can see based on that on top of like an overlay of the different things that grow there. You know, area 11, Santa Clara, bell peppers, uh, mushrooms, lettuce, grapes, you know, wines, that makes sense, right? Uh, area 12, where's area 12? Oh, right here, Stanislaus, oh, area 12. That's where all our asparagus comes from. I cuss, you cuss, we all cuss for asparagus. So we have a very diverse agriculture present and future. You know, as we deal with drought and the lack of water, it does become harder for us to grow things, but there's supply and demand, which is also a problem because we actually throw away about 40% of all agriculture in the United States before it even reaches some form of, of sale. You know, and, you know, maybe before it even gets like a rouse or whatever it might be. Uh, because maybe it's too big, too small, it looks weird, stuff like that. That's another conversation. What about our fossil record? Well, we have a really unique, we have one of the most diverse fossil records out of all states in the United States. Uh, we've got things that are in the Paleozoic, Cenozoic, Pleistocene. What does that mean to you? So looking at these eras, we have fossils in California that transverses looking over 500 million years of history. In fact, I have some uh, ammonites uh, ammonites that are somewhere on the order of mm, about 350-ish million years old that I found along the eastern Sierra. Now this is a geologic time scale. This is not, that doesn't mean we have all these things in California, but I picked this because it shows the different eras, eras and areas in which we would have found fossils. So during the Paleozoic, California was under warm, shallow seas. That being said, we found lots of different types of warm, shallow sea uh, invertebrates such as ammonites, trilo uh, trilobite, I think I showed this one already, that's a trilobite right there, this, you know, sea animal in a sense, it's like a complex cockroach, uh, brachiopods, stuff like this, this is, uh, this was actually taken from the Santa Monica Mountains, so we have these that date back, you know, 400 plus million years old, then in the Cenozoic, uh, which is this area right about here, not a whole lot happened here. We don't have, there are some things in the Mesozoic, but not a whole lot that we, not nothing exciting like this. Mostly avian birds is what we found out of this era. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. Uh, so the Cenozoic is where we found more of our, our mammals, where we had our camels, three-toed horses. Oh, crown clothes, oh my gosh. It's one of those days. Sloths. Uh, ground sloths and dire wolves were found, and also our state fossil, which is the Smilodon or the saber-toothed cat. That was all within uh, the Cenozoic era. And then the Pleistocene, which is part of the Quaternary, that's the La Brea tar pits. So let me look, let me share this real quick here. These are looking at some of the fossils found in California throughout our time. Uh, places that they were found, I think the uh, Plotosaurus was found up in Modesto, uh, Megalodon, look at the, in comparison to the white shark, the Megalodon is was massive. Um, those are actually found up in a 
not quite Bakersfield area, but along the grapevine, uh, there's a shark. It's called Shark Tooth Hill, where there it was a just a, a it's an entire mountainside filled with shark teeth. Uh, here's a Smilodon, which we have found throughout the entire state. Uh, this is the Californosaurus, uh, and then this guy here, he was found, I think, by Santa Cruz. But we, we don't find a lot of them because you have to think also that you need the, the appropriate environment for these things to be left behind and then to be preserved. The one that I did not share in here would be the mammoth. We found there's mammoths everywhere in Southern California and also part of Eastern Sierra. I was on an expedition where we got to actually dig up the rear leg of a mammoth, which is pretty cool. Um, we also got to see the tusk. That's all that remained. He actually died about 10,000 years ago along the uh, northern shore of the Owens Lake. And he died in uh, in a sand along the beach in a sand dune, so he wasn't preserved very well. But uh, they just found another uh, mammoth somewhere else. I think it was down in Ventura County. They find them often uh, when doing plowing, like for uh, agriculture. And then the big crane gets caught on something, and they pull up a huge head with the tusks. It was pretty cool that we still have these things that date back not just you know ten thousand, but looking up to three hundred million years in our history that we can find throughout the state. So I mentioned the La Brea Tar Pits. So here's some photos of the La Brea, of the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, obviously, oil wells. Those rigs were all over Southern California. Uh, here they are pulling up. Looks like a part of a, a hip bone femur and stuff like that. Uh, putting them in nut boxes, I guess, is all they had. So the La Brea Tar Pits has a really unique history. If you've never been, I really, really suggest that you get a chance to go. So Rancho La Brea, which is interesting because we call it the La Brea Tar Pits, but La Brea means the tar anyway, so it's like the tar, the tar pits. But anyway, was part of a Mexican land grant back in 1828, and the tar was being used as asphalt in early Los Angeles growth uh, as roads. So it was very different. They would just kind of put a slurry down and then kind of compact it. But as early as 1901, fossil bones were being removed to be studied. They did find them before then, but they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't of great concern. But 1901, they actually were being removed and studied. Uh, between 1913 and 1915, over three-quarter of a million specimens of plants and animals were removed just within those two years uh, within the tar pits. As Los Angeles grew, uh, Hancock Park was then created in 1924 to be an area of preservation because this was a two-year grant that was given to paleontologists and geographers to go out and dig in there to find some stuff. And they, they realized that wasn't enough time, so they actually were able to designate some of the original Rancho La Brea to be part of a preservation. 1963, the area was designated as a national landmark. landmark. 1977, the museum opens, and fun fact, since 1913, over 3.5 million species have been found. Uh, and one 9,000-year-old woman was found in the tar pits as well, which is pretty cool. Um, again, 3.5 million is a lot. We're finding, you know, they may not all be articulated, but we're looking at different plants. We're looking at skulls and teeth and, and tusks and legs and stuff like that. So they're, they're still pulling stuff out. In fact, the La Brea Tar Pits, just about 20 years ago, there was also uh, a murder history scene thing. Um, someone got dumped out there, and LAPD had to get involved because someone tried to put, it was just really interesting. If you're into that type of, like, crime stuff, um, that, that was the most recent, like, person they had to pull out of there, but that was a whole other whole other conversation. But the, the tar pits, if you've not been, is absolutely incredible. Uh, what the, they're able to essentially do is they go down, they scoop up a bunch of this tar. Because what ended up happening is you have these tar pits, and they've been there for thousands of years. Uh, it's an excretion of tar. The animals would get stuck in it, then they would get pulled down. When they get, Then other animals would try to get to them, and they would get pulled down, kind of like quicksand. So you're seeing entire species articulated being pulled into the tar pits so it's then you're pulling them out and a lot of the skin and fur and feathers is actually preserved because it was completely enveloped by tar since we're talking about unique things i don't know if you've heard of it but if you have not it's something definite to check out the pygmy mammoth of the channel islands so the channel islands are really unique there's an interesting photo of it 
The Channel Islands were actually part of the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, during our last glacial maxima, a lot of the water was out of the ocean onto the land, which then therefore creates land bridges between the islands and the mainland. Um, although it is believed that the Pygmy Mammoth was would have been an, an incredible swimmer, that they could have gone out there, but it's been most believed that it would have been more appropriate for them to take the land bridge out, and then they would have stayed on the island because there was no reason for them to go back to the mainland. Uh, so it's a bunch of pygmy mammoths uh, in size. They're about seven foot tall. They're obviously not, now all extinct, but they're still finding complete mammoth you know, articulated pieces. Um, this would have been a descendant of the Colombian mammoth, which is what we're more known for on the mainland in California. Uh, but something you may not have heard of. I guess that was kind of interesting, the pygmy mammoth. Um, there's also a great link in the Canvas module that I've shared uh, of the fossil identifier and, and, find, and finder is what it's called, the fossil finder, where you're able to kind of look around and find fossils uh, throughout the state and states of the United States, but mostly California is what we're interested in. But to just see that we have, we have such a diverse, an incredible diverse background. And this is really important for us to understand because it's like, yeah, okay, we can talk about a pygmy mammoth that's super cool, but then we need to talk about, well, wait, how did it get there? Why did it go extinct? Is it possible again? You know, will we see a land bridge? If, if, the, if the world goes through another glacial maxima and ice caps start to refreeze, are we going to have land bridges again? You know, how did that change the, the biogeography of, of just the human development, the biology of that, of the land masses having land bridges so people could then walk across the different straits between different continents that otherwise would have been completely submerged underwater. Lots to think about, I know. But I guess I wanted to share a little bit about what biogeography is and just to kind of paint a picture of how diverse it is in California. There's so much to study, so much to talk about, and we only have a very limited amount of time. Again, I really appreciate you checking out this video. Don't for forget to click like, subscribe. Don't forget to comment below if you have any other questions or things you want to share. Maybe you've seen the Pygmy Mammoth. Please share there. Otherwise, thank you again, and we'll talk soon.